I'm Jeff Butler with the Butler Law Firm, and today we'll talk a little bit about NEMT vans, that is, non-emergency medical transportation vans. A lot of people hadn't heard of these vans. Quickly, we'll discuss what they are. They're a form of transportation, usually a van, um, designed to carry people who have special medical needs from one place to another when it's not an emergency situation. Obviously, if someone's been in a car wreck and they need emergency medical help, an ambulance is the transportation they need, or a, a medevac helicopter. But sometimes, if someone with special medical needs is going from their house to a therapist appointment, or from a nursing home to a doctor's appointment, they need some kind of specialized transportation, but it's not an emergency, so it can be scheduled ahead of time. And that's when an NEMT, non-emergency medical transportation van, comes into play. We've probably seen these on the highway, all of us. Uh, behind me is a picture of some of them. They can look just like normal vans, although sometimes on the side it'll have like the name of the company and a contact number uh, and that kind of thing. The people who ride these vans are some of the most vulnerable people in our society. They're, they already have specialized medical needs, obviously, and normally they're in a wheelchair, sometimes a stretcher, or some other kind of specialized transportation. So there are a couple things that have to be done. Uh, to transport these folks carefully. First, the company that runs the NEMT vans needs to hire safe drivers. We always want to avoid a collision because the driver could be hurt, the people in the other car could be hurt, and of course the passenger in the NEMT vehicle could be hurt. But in addition to normal safe driving, whoever operates an NEMT vehicle needs to make sure they secure their own passenger. And that means some specialized things in this context because the people who are riding in the NEMT vans can't typically sit in a normal seat and use a shoulder strap like you or I might. So uh, you need specialized equipment for that and someone who knows how to use it. Here's an image of someone being loaded into an NEMT van who's in a wheelchair. You can see there's a, a, a strap across her chest to keep her secured. What you can't really see here, and which we'll examine in a minute, is the way that this wheelchair is secured to the van. So that if there's a collision or even like a strange bump or something like that, this passenger doesn't get thrown out of a wheelchair and bang her head and neck on the floor or something like that. This diagram shows some of the ways in which a wheelchair can be strapped down. You can see there's four attachment points from the wheelchair to the floor and then another that works like a normal shoulder strap. And we can see some actual images of this. Sometimes any EMT vehicles will have anchor points in the floor, like on the picture behind me here. Sometimes there'll be the, those metal tracks uh, that we've probably all seen sometime or another in our lives, and that can work fine if it's used safely. Another thing to think about in any EMT transportation is the loading and unloading of the passenger. So we're not only concerned about what happens during the drive, but someone in a wheelchair or on a stretcher has to be taken out of the van and put in a van. Um, and that has to be done right because as we'll talk about later, if somebody falls while they're being lifted into a van, the consequences can be really bad. So in Georgia, for a long time, the number one leading company uh, that managed any EMP transportation was called Logisticare. They got into some trouble. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution um, in 2017 published an expose um, on this company. You can see the title here, Lax Oversight uh, Leaves Patients at Risk in the Medicare Rides Program. After this, uh, Logisticare got in some trouble and they changed their name. They became Motive Care. And now Motive Care. Uh, at that point, Motive Care became the biggest manager of NEMT transportation in Georgia. I've got some facts about them. They operate not only in Georgia, but in 41 states and the District of Columbia. In Georgia, from 2012 to 2017, according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, um, Logisticare, now Motive Care, was assessed $485,000 in fines. So I want to write these numbers on the board so that we can kind of compare. So that's um, in fines, $485,000. 
And that seems like a lot, right? You would think, okay, if um, such a hefty fine is being imposed, perhaps the bureaucrats at Georgia's Department of Community Health are doing their job. Well, the other fact is that during that same period, Georgia paid Logistic Care, now Motive Care, $230 million. So when they were fined that $485,000, they were being paid $230 million. So that's a whole nother set of zeros. In other words, the fine was one-fifth of 1% 1 of the amount that Georgia paid to this company to provide any EMT transportation. Um, you might have noticed earlier when talking about the company, I, I had to say that Logistic Care and Motive Care managed any EMT transportation. Well, why phrase it that way? Because what the company often does is instead of providing the service itself, it strikes the deal, it takes money to provide the transportation, but doesn't actually run the vans. Instead, Motive Care or Logistic Care before it will contract with smaller companies, the little mom and pop shops that maybe have one van or two and provide this care. Why would they do that? Because then when something bad happens and a lawsuit gets filed, Motive Care can say, oh, no, 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 that, that wasn't us. We didn't mess up. That was this little company that we hired to actually do the transportation. We can't possibly be held responsible for that. It's what we call a shell game. I want to talk about some specifics, um, and we'll go through briefly this article in the Atlanta Journal Constitution and talk about some of the folks who've been affected because it gives us an idea of um, how this can work and how these injuries can occur. And we'll do this by going through the pictures. Um, this is the sister of Jesse Taylor. We'll come back to her in just a minute. This was the former head of the uh, Department of Community Health who was supposed to oversee this program. He initially agreed, according to the AJC, um, to give an interview in this article, but then backed out and decided he didn't want to do that after all. This is Cindy Behrman. She was a quadriplegic. And uh, the accident with her occurred when she was being loaded into the transportation van. She uh, was loaded in, something happened. It wasn't initially clear what until the autopsy report came out and it turned out the cause of her death was that she had been dropped on her face onto concrete and her 200 pound wheelchair fell on top of her. This is Patricia Ann Smith. Um, she was being transported in one of these NEM2 vans and hadn't been strapped down like she was supposed to be. The driver decided to take a shortcut, I guess, across like a grass parking lot and hit a pothole. Caused her uh, wheelchair to flip over. Obviously, she's not in great health. That's why she's in an NEMT vehicle in the first place. And the injury she sustained when her wheelchair flipped over caused her to lose an arm. She had an arm amputated. And she filed the case, took the case all the way to trial. The jury returned a verdict of $5 million in her favor. This is the last example we'll give. Um, this, again, is the sister of Jesse Taylor, who after his death had, I don't know if you can see this, had her brother, uh, brother's face tattooed on her arm. But his wheelchair flipped over while he was being driven home in an NEMT van. The driver picked the, the guy up, set him down, and then dropped him off at his house as though nothing had happened. But the, the family figured out that something was not right with uh, Mr. Taylor took him to the hospital. Turned out he had a bruised head, a broken th thigh, and a sprained neck. He was hospitalized for three months and ultimately died. When confronted later about why he didn't fess up and acknowledge immediately what had happened, the driver of this NEMG van said he didn't want to lose his job. As you can tell, these can be significant cases. You have some of the most vulnerable people in our society who need help and the, the, either they are paying to get the transportation help they need or the state is paying for it and oftentimes it is just not being provided. As the AJC article shows, 
Department of Community Health has not done a great job of making sure that this transportation is safe and reliable. If they're not going to do it, that leaves the course. Thank you.